Lord, as we as we come to you this morning, Father, and open up your word, and Lord, we just ask that you would send your spirit and that you would give help as only you can. And Father, we just, uh, as my brother prayed earlier, just uh, ask that you would help me make things clear, Lord, and that be understood and that it would be uh, according to your word and and that it would be true father just pray that you would uh, you would help in jesus name amen all right so i wanted to to talk this morning and i just i don't know the the title of the lesson this morning is an often overlooked component in evangelism and I almost, I was kind of wrestling with, you know, the word component. Was there a better, a better word for it to really convey what I wanted to, uh, to talk about this morning? And, you know, thought about an often overlooked person, but uh, it's kind of not the direction really I'm going to go. That person would be the Holy Spirit. Um, but I want to talk about more about what the Holy Spirit does in the believer uh, as we look at evangelism. And some of the things that I want to look at and some of the things I'm going to say uh, may be easily misunderstood if you read something into what I don't say. If you, if you listen to something I say and then read into it more than what I'm saying, then it'll be easy to misunderstand what I'm actually saying uh, and, and where I'm going uh, this morning. And I'll just tell you up front where I'm going to it is I believe the foundation for evangelism is holiness. I believe that that is... Just as the foundation for the church is what? Well, what does the church have to be built on? Christ. There's another, there's something else scripture mis- mentions as the foundation of the church. The, the, the apostles and the prophets, the teaching of the apostles and the prophets. Christ being the first stone laid, Christ being the cornerstone of the church, him being the head of of the church well just just in no from no one particular scripture so much but from just really looking at the new testament and what does what is the emphasis of the new testament what is the emphasis of the apostles teaching to the church um and and how does that apply to evangelism um There's not many messages, I don't think, that I've heard personally on what I'm going to talk about. There's a lot of information out there as far as helps in evangelism and how to approach people and how to start conversations and, and all those things. There's, there's a lot of stuff out there for that. Um, so I'm not going to really be touching on that. What is evangelism? Someone tell me what, what is evangelism? How how would you define it? Spreading the gospel, and, and the gospel is good news. Yeah, so evangelism is bringing good news, bringing good news to people. What do you call someone, and I changed the way I worded this, what do you call someone who has this good news to bring? No. No. Not an evangelist, a believer, a Christian. Yeah, and and I I originally was going to ask, why do you call someone that brings the good news? But the right answer for that would be evangelist. Uh, but someone who has this good news to take to people, or that's a Christian, that's a believer. We we have this good news. Is everyone an evangelist? Yes, no. You have to define evangelist, don't you? You have to define what do I mean by evangelist when I, when I ask that. Um, according to Ephesians 4, 
Let's turn turn to Ephesians four, and we're going to be doing somewhat of a Bible drill this morning. I think Ephesians four eleven, Paul says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves can't find any place to stop when you're reading Paul and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning by craftiness and deceitful schemes Um, we certainly don't want to get into that in evangelism Uh, as defined by this that that he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherd teachers, is everyone an evangelist according to that verse? No, this is speaking more of a calling, more of an office, a role of an evangelist. Someone specially gifted and equipped by God for the purpose of taking the gospel uh, to the world. Uh, in Acts 21, we won't turn there, Philip. It's Philip the Evangelist. Philip is referred to as an evangelist. But, but who was Philip? He was a deacon. He was a deacon. He was one of the first deacons in the church. Uh, in 2 Timothy 4.5, Paul tells Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. But yet, what was the role, the primary role that he was fulfilling at that time? It was giving oversight to the church it was it was basically being a pastor at the time but uh, but Paul wanted to remind them you you have more giftings than than that be sure and 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 fulfill all the role all that the the gifts given to you when hands were laid on you um so an, another question is there anywhere in scripture that we see the church engaging engaging in what I going to refer to a couple times as apostolic evangelism. Now, what do I mean by that? What, what is apostolic evangelism? Doing evangelism the way the apostles did, where they would go out into the town square, they would go to the gate of the city, they would go into the, into the town, and they would be proclaiming Christ, preaching Christ, you know, Paul going to the Gentiles, he would find, is there a synagogue? He would go to the synagogue, and he would uh, do it in the manner that the Jews would do within the synagogue, proclaiming Christ from the Scripture, expounding the Scriptures to them, and then going out into the, the streets, uh, into the marketplaces, and, and proclaiming Christ. Can you think of anywhere in Scripture where, where we find the church at large doing apostolic evangelism? Acts 4. What verse? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter who was an apostle. Now we're apostles part of the church, yes. But when I say church, I'm speaking of the congregation, the, the, the believers gathered together, those who did not hold an office, just the lay people, we would, we would refer to it. I, I don't know of any. I can't think of any. Other than possibly in Acts 8, 1 through 4, or, or 1 and 4, um, it says Saul uh, approved of his execution And there arose that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout all the regions in Judea and Samaria. And then in verse 4, and those who were scattered went about preaching the word. That's the only place I can think of in Scripture where it talks about the church like going out and doing evangelism, except what is it really describing there? persecution came and they were fleeing for their lives they packed up their goods and possessions and they were moving out of jerusalem 
And as they went, wherever they went, they were proclaiming Christ. So I don't really think this is even talking about them going out and doing evangelism, but rather it's when they went, the Gospel went with them. Why? Because they were Christians. Because they were followers of Christ. They were suffering uh, because of their stance that they took, having been baptized uh, and assembling together with the saints. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would think so. He was holding an office in the church and he was recognized as an evangelist. So along with being being set apart uh, as a servant of the church, as a deacon. Uh, he apparently was also an evangelist in the church. He's, he's referenced, you know, Philip the evangelist. So I think he was, he was uh, gifted in that and, and part of his ministry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He would be considered an apostle. Not, not capital A, but lowercase a, he, yeah, he was doing the work of an apostle. He was going around to different cities proclaiming Christ, preaching Christ. He wasn't one of the twelve, but uh, I believe he's referred to, I can't remember where, I haven't looked at it. I believe he's actually referred to as an apostle, similar to Barnabas. And uh, yeah. So is there anywhere in Scripture where the church is told to go out and engage, and engage in apostolic evangelism? Is there any teaching of the church? And again, I'm using, I'm not saying evangelism. That's why I'm, I'm using apostolic, that kind and that form of evangelism. Again, going out and preaching in the streets, going and open air preaching, you know, going, going out and, and ministering in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, is there anyone here who has never open air preached before? I haven't. Does that mean I've never done evangelism? I hope not. I hope that's not what that means, but it's a form. It's a form of evangelism, and um, uh, one of the things I'm really hoping, you know, you know, to get to get to here very soon is uh, what we think of when we think of evangelism. Uh, is it is evangelism going and passing out tracts? Where do y'all go here? Where are some places y'all go here? Yeah, going door to door apartment complexes or. A good place, like in Corpus, we go to the seawall. Go to, um, uh, we've been to uh, parades. Go out and pass out uh, to colleges. Uh, you know, different events. It's usually usually evangelism. I think we think about that. We think about going uh, going out like that and doing evangelism. And and I mean, we should. That is definitely a part of it. Um, I don't I can't think of any scripture where the church is given instruction to go out and proclaim Christ in that way and referring to the great commission if if we are going to do the same exegesis of that and use the same hermeneutics to the great commission that I I hope to use in Habakkuk and Romans the preaching later Who's speaking and who is being spoken to? Jesus is speaking and He's speaking to His apostles. And He's telling them, as you go, make disciples of all men. Because that is, it's not really that. Evangelism is a component in that, but it's the disciple making which has a lot to do with the, proclaiming the Gospel where it's never been told. Uh, teaching and instruction, giving instruction to people, leading them. Um, now, what was part of that instruction that they were given? T- 
teaching them, teaching the converts, teaching the disciples you make to observe all the things I've commanded you. So in that sense, yeah, it does come down to the church to engage in that. But again, as we've seen, God has given the gift of evangelists to the church in the same way that He's given the gift of, of a pastor of a church as prophets, as the apostles were a gift to the church. Um, and, and, and again, th- this, is, this is the point that I was talking to at the beginning when I, when I said, don't read more into what I'm saying than what I'm actually saying. Because this is not an anti-evangelism uh, lesson this morning. It is a pro-evangelism message. But I want, to, I want us to kind of start thinking about how the Bible lays things out when it does come to evangelism. And I mean, I've met Christians before, you probably have too, people that are gifted in evangelism, people that, you know, they may very well be those evangelists given to the church as a gift that what do they think everyone should be doing? Exactly what they're doing, how they're doing it with the same zeal that they're doing it, right? Just like someone that's gifted as, as, a, as a preacher, what do they think everyone should be doing? Everyone should be studying the Scripture every spare moment that you have during the day and, and taking in the knowledge and, and teaching others. And I mean, it's, we, we, tend to, we, we tend to look... It's, a, it's really a Western mindset, I think. Where, whereas in, in Scripture, in, in the early church, it was very much a community mindset. And you see it in much of the, the teaching... The the New Testament teaching is not to you, singular. It's to you, plural, the church. That's the the vast majority of the teaching is to you, the church. Losing it here. Um, And to think like that. um, So not everyone is called to do the work of an evangelist. But everyone is called, as as we'll get to, is called to be salt and light. Everyone is told, Peter says, be ready to give an answer, to give an answer when someone asks you for the hope that lies within you. And that's, that's the place I'm, I'm wanting to go is are we living lives in such a way that people ask us, what's up with you? Why are you different? Are, are we living that kind of life? Are, are we laying a foundation so that when we open up our mouths and speak, that the words are going to carry weight? That there's going to be something behind it? And for that, we need the Holy Spirit. We need to do what, what Paul get, instructed the Ephesians to do. Be filled with the Spirit. Be Always be filled. Constantly be filled with the Spirit. And that, if you go and if you... I'm not going to go there because I don't want to get sidetracked there, but go sometime and read what he's talking about. Read the context. What does he mean, be filled with the Spirit? It's... It's in how you live. It's in doing good deeds. It's what you do. That's the filling. It's uh, we just talked about it Sunday. It's where it's the Greek word is where we get plethora from, and also also uh, cornucopia. You know what a cornucopia is? It's that thing you see at Thanksgiving, the big spiral looking thing, and 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 what is it? Is it empty? Is it full? It's overflowing. That, that's it. Be, be overflowing with the Spirit so that what you do is done in the Spirit. Um, we need the Holy Spirit in our lives so that He is flowing out of us. Um, look at Jesus' ministry. How did Jesus' ministry begin? Where did His ministry begin? In Luke 3, we can turn to Luke. 
We've got a few passages here close together. Luke 3, verse 21. Not John 3, Luke 3. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, he was praying, and the heavens were open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph. Um, so it began at his baptism is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And what happened at his baptism? The Spirit of God came on him in power. Why did Jesus do the things he did? Because he was filled with the Spirit and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so that what he did, he did as a man through the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember what, he, what Paul wrote to the Philippians. He laid aside what he had right to and emptied himself and became a man. So that the things he did, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. So, again, he faced temptation, uh, being a high priest who can... Uh, relate to us and having been tempted uh, he was filled with the spirit and uh, the spirit led him and sustained him to be able to stand up to temptation and not give in to it and then in in chapter 4 verse 14 and jesus returned in the power of the spirit to galilee and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country and he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all verse 18 when he goes in and he takes the scroll of isaiah and opens it up and reads the spirit of the lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor and he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives recovery of sight to the blind and set at liberty those who were oppressed to proclaim the year of the lord's favor and he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down in the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him and he began to say to them today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing so jesus the author of our salvation the 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 savior of the world he he himself his ministry was done in the power of the holy spirit being filled with the spirit in order to go out and fulfill what was written of him here, the proclamation of the kingdom of God. When we look at the apostles, the apostolic ministry, how did it begin? The Great Commission in, in Acts, uh, I'm sorry, in Matthew 28, where Jesus tells them, you know, to, it, we always say go, but it really it's as you are going. In the Greek, it's going, uh, the act of going, as you are going. Uh, make disciples because he was going to send them out into into the world um, in acts chapter 1 <clears throat> verse 8 jesus tells them but you will receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in jerusalem and all judea and samaria and to the ends of the earth um, being a witness for Christ was tied to receiving power when the Spirit came upon them. In Acts 2, verses 4 and 14, when Peter stands up and he, he preaches there at the day of Pentecost after, Pentecost, after the Spirit had been poured out on them, he being filled with the Spirit, he stands up and he preaches and he proclaims Christ and 3,000 souls are converted. In Acts 6, when we read about Stephen, uh, Stephen also, verse 55, being filled with the Spirit, having just proclaimed and, and about to die, literally, you know, his last breath says, being filled with the Spirit, he gazed up into heaven and saw the heavens open. And he says, I see, I see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Most High. Uh, 
Acts chapter 9 when we read about Saul. Acts 9, 17 through 20. Uh, Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, Saul says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying he is the Son of God. So we see with Jesus and with the apostles uh, a common thing when their ministries began, at the beginning of their ministries, the strength they had to, to go out and do the work of an evangelist. Again, referring to the calling, the ministry, the office of, of, of an evangelist. They were filled with the Spirit. They were empowered by the Spirit. They were equipped with the Spirit to do so. We, we need the same thing. Uh, When we, when we read the, the New Testament epistles written to the churches, what seems to be a primary concern overall, without getting into specifics of each letter, like why was Galatians written to the Galatians? Why was you know, 1 Corinthians written to the church at Corinth? But, but when we look at all of them, overall overarching concerns and instructions that are similar that we would find in, in most of the epistles, uh, no matter the specific problems being addressed. Um, and this is, you know, this is just some things that I thought of off the top of my head. What is, when we think of Paul especially, what does he typically begin his epistles with? The, theology. I mean, he gives a greeting, and but he, he typically begins with theology and he he gives theology and then he gets into application and and giving instruction not not every every instance but again i'm looking at kind of the overall principle that we see uh, there's concern for the purity of the, of the church and its obedience to jesus christ as lord we see the unity and love of the saints uh, in their fellowship together, in their conduct together as a church, as, as the church assembled together, uh, really as they're living their lives in community together. And I don't mean communal living. I don't mean like they all bought a little property of land and all moved and, and lived to it. But they shared their lives together. I mean, that's Acts 2. They had all things in common. That doesn't mean they all lived together. But, but they all share. You know, what you need? You need something? Here, I've got it. Here. Um, that is a primary concern uh, in the epistles to the churches is the, the unity and the love for the saints, uh, which is followed up by unity and love in the home, in the family, husbands and wives and children. And, and I would even include work life in that, masters and bond servants, because for them, a lot of times, you know, the home was a part of the work environment. Walking in a manner worthy of the Gospel towards those who are outside is also something you've seen brought up. Um, an example is seen in, in Paul's prayer for the Colossians. And we just started going through Colossians on, on Tuesday nights. This was, this was fresh in my mind. In Colossians 1, 10, beginning in, in 9. Here we have Paul's prayer for them. Uh, Paul often in his, in his opening of an epistle included what his prayer is for the church. In one nine, he says, So from the day we heard about their faith, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that's his prayer. That they would be filled with the knowledge of, the, of Christ's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. 
Why would he pray for that? For what it produces. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Um, Paul's desire for them is that they would know Christ. They would know His will. Uh, that they would know Him for the effect that that would have on their life to serve Him, to obey Him. Um, so that they would walk in a manner worthy, deserving of the Lord. Deserving and appropriate of someone who names the name of Christ. And that they are not taken captive by carnal and worldly philosophy and empty deceit, which he gets onto later in the letter. He wants them to live holy lives, walking in the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, and instructs them on what this looks like in, in chapters 3 and 4, where he gets into the application of it, putting off the old self, putting on the new self, how they live with, uh, with each other, letting the Word of Christ dwell in them and and not lying to each other, being compassionate and kind and, and, and uh, humble and meek, being patient with each other. And then he gets into the family. Wives and husbands and children and masters and bondservants. And then in chapter 4, he, he, he gets to how to behave to those outside the church. In Colossians 4-5, walk in wisdom towards outsiders making the best use of the time let your speech always be gracious seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person i i, I love the wisdom that paul says here what's the first thing he says concerning outsiders how you walk how you live your life before them essentially he says make sure you're living right before you talk. And then when you talk, make sure you're talking right. That, that's his concern. Walking in wisdom. Now, what, what, what do you think that would be towards outsiders? That we're living in a way that, that distinguishes us from the outsiders. So that our lives, our everyday life, how we go about our lives every day is holy. It's separated from them. It's different than the world. What happens when you have a difficult work environment and you're not treated fairly, the bosses don't treat people fairly, and everyone around you is just grumbling and complaining and always talking about the bosses, always talking about oh, they don't care for us, and man, they do this, they should do this for us, they're cheating us out of this. Well, I'm not going to, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to do that. That's not part of my job description. What do you do? Do you murmur and complain with them? God kills people for murmuring and complaining. Christians aren't supposed to do that. We see that in 1 Corinthians 10. You know, these things were written down. What happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness? It was written down for us, for our instructions, for our learning, so that we wouldn't do what they did. Some of them murmured and complained and were killed because of it. God disciplined his child Israel for their murmuring and complaining. Our manner of life. Do we adorn the Gospel? In Titus 2.10, he's, he's speaking to speaking to bond servants here. So he's speaking to you know, make it applicable to us. He's speaking to employees. In verse 9, bondservants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, not, uh, but showing all good faith 
so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of our Lord, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus, Jesus Christ. So, addressing the bond servants, addressing workers, employees, he's saying how you live your life needs to adorn the doctrine of God because God is interested in saving people. And how you live your life in front of them matters. There was, there was something in, I believe it was the 90s, friendship evangelism. Friendship evangelism was real good, or, or real big, real popular in evangelical churches. And there was, there was a lot of good to it, but unfortunately, as with most gimmicks, it became perverted. Um, the idea is, is be friends to people and be nice to people and get to know people in an effort to kind of sneak Christ in unnoticed somehow into your friendship that you've already built. And so you, because you've built that friendship, well, then you'll be able to, to bring Christ in. Well, that is garbage. That is garbage. But friendship evangelism is biblical. To be a friend. To do kind to everyone. Especially the household of faith. And here's, here's one thing that Scripture says explicitly and, and by implication in, in several places. How is the world going to know you're a Christian? By your love? by the love that you have for one another. In other words, your, your love for the people of God should be such that people outside can see it and they go, there's a Christian. Now, to them, what is that going to look like? How many days do you go to church? Well, it's, it's the middle of the week. What are you going to church for? Well, what do you, you spend your Friday nights doing what? You do what you do what with who on Saturday night? You're doing what Saturday? You're going where? That, that, that's what it looks like to them, but what do they know? We're always with the church. We're always with those who call upon the name of the Lord. Being salt and light, doing good. What is the primary focus? of the epistles again. It's life inside the church. It's, it's the relationships inside the church. It's love and unity inside the body. If, if you can have a strong, united body full of love and good deeds for each other, what's going to happen? Whew. It's going to spill out into every part of your life because that's who you are. You are loving. You are friendly. You are compassionate. You are full of good deeds. But it's to spill out of here to the outside around us. The primary concern of Scripture, again, is it, it's the church and how the church lives its lives. And especially, number one concern is not family. Number one concern is here. It's the body. It's with each other. And then it goes to husbands, wives, children. And then it goes to masters and servants. Then it goes to those outside. It's not always exactly in that order, but when you, when you read it again, overall, that's the order. We need to adorn the Gospel. And Peter, Peter writing to a persecuted and suffering church, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. He says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So that's one thing as a people of God we are to be doing is proclaiming the excellencies of God. Testifying, boasting, bragging on God. So beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles. And he's writing to primarily to the Jewish believers here, those of the dispersion. And Gentiles here primarily has to do with unbelievers. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Again, the seeing of our good deeds. What is seen? Walking in a manner worthy of the Gospel is building a foundation for when we open our mouth and speak. In 2.18-21, through 21, he deals with with servants, and not only to the good, but to the unjust masters, the, the servant is to obey them. Why? Verse 19, for this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin you are beaten for it you endure? But when you do good and suffer for it, you endure this, uh, and you endure this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. He talks about the same thing with wives in, in 1 through 6, so that even the husbands who don't obey the word, what? They might be one without a word. You don't think this ha- has applications outside the role of a wife? It, it's, it's spoken to the wife because the wife is to submit to her husband. What kind of husband? The one she's married to. <laughs> that kind of husband. So that even if he doesn't obey the word, that he might be one even without a word by her conduct, by what she says. Aren't, aren't you supposed to submit to your masters, to your bosses? So even if they're unjust, how you relate to them, how you act towards them, you don't think one day... I, re, I remember one day I was working with a guy. A uh, new guy, didn't know him. I worked with him about half the day and we had kind of gotten away from from the crowd and we were you know we were walking through an empty place on the job site going to do something and we're walking along and he just out of the clear blue he just says you're a christian aren't you I'm like well yeah <laughs> why do you ask he's like, oh you don't cuss I mean, we had just had going through real difficult situations and aggravations and and all that, and and that stuck out. He's like, "Oh, well, you don't cuss." I figured you're a Christian. That, that's 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 how we need to live our lives in such a way that our actions or lack of actions adorn the the doctrine of God, so that we're different. In, in chapter 3, 1 Peter, verse 13. He says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So that when, when someone makes fun of you or puts you down or something for doing something, that other lost people stick up for you. That happens. Because of your kindness, because of your gentleness, because of your goodness towards them, living, loving them, serving them, so that some people, there, there's always those people. I, I remember working with one guy. He was a painter, and and uh, I remember when first meeting him, and he, he finds out I'm a Christian, and he's like, he said, uh, you know, my name's Leo, right? You know what Leo means, right? I was like, yeah, lion. He's like, yeah. He's like, they used to feed Christians to the lions, you know. 
And he was always kind of, he was, he was, you know, he was a good guy. He wasn't that, but he was always, he was always trying to make jabs. Uh, we had a good relationship. We got along, we got along well, but at the same time, he was kind of always, always trying to make jabs uh, because of, because of Christ. Um, be ready to give an answer. And, and again, it, it, it doesn't say be ready to speak. Be ready to tell them. Be ready to give an apology. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. And the implication is they notice it. Again, he's writing to a persecuted church here, a persecuted people. And, and he expects those around them to see hope in them. Again, I'm, what I'm getting at is laying a foundation for evangelism and walking a holy life. First Thessalonians says we ought to walk to please God, to walk properly before outsiders. In First Thessalonians 4. In Matthew 5, what does Jesus say? He's, he's teaching there on the Sermon on the Mount. Written to to his, his disciples, those gathered around him there. Matthew 5, verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Again, he doesn't say be salt. If we're a follower of Christ, he says you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall it be? How its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to throw out and be trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. What Jesus was most concerned about here with being salt and light had to do with how people lived their lives seeing your good works so that they see what you do. Now why? Why was Christ concerned most of all with what people did? Why is the Scripture concerned most of all with what people do? We have a, we have a saying. Actions speak louder than words. You can go out and you can tell people about Jesus all day, but if you're cussing, if you're joining in on the dirty jokes, if you're getting angry, if you're talking bad about people, if you're slandering people, if people come to you for help and you say, no, I don't have time for that. Your words are empty. They're vain. They don't mean anything. How is a Christian different from an unbeliever? If there's not that foundation of good deeds, if there's not the, the holy life, if we're not adorning the Gospel of God with, with how we live. What is a trait of salt when it comes to a person's senses? As I was thinking about this, uh, it was either last night or this morning, uh, thinking of how our lives relate to, uh, to the senses, to our sense of taste, our sense of smell, and our, and our sense of, of sight and vision. Uh, Saltiness, salt is a flavor enhancer. It, it, it makes something palatable. It, it, it leaves a good flavor in the mouth. The, the salt of the worth, if it's, if it's lost, if it's lost its taste, if it no longer has, if it's been tainted, you know, they would also use salt as a preservative. If you take salt and you pack a fish in it, do you want to use that salt to season your other food with? Why? It's lost its taste. It's become perverted. It's no longer pure. It's taken on. It's absorbed what was around it. We don't want our lives to be like that. Light. Light enables us to see things around us. Light shines and, and is seen as something visible. So we want to let our light 
shine so that people what see Christ in us so that when we speak about Christ there's a foundation that's built something something there in 2 Corinthians uh, I didn't write it down but it had to do with the sense of smell um, the aroma of Christ to who? To God. We are the aroma of Christ to God. To some, it's the aroma of death unto death. To others, it's the life unto life. But the aroma is what? Pleasing to God. Paul talking about him, the apostles, and, and their ministry and what they did and when they would go out there in, in taking the gospel out and what they did in their ministry, they were an aroma of Christ to God. It's like a, it was incense before Him. It brought death to some, but it was pleasing to God. What, what they did in their ministry, they were rejected. You remember Peter, Pentecost, 3,000 souls brought in, 5,000 souls brought in. <laughs> Go to jail. It doesn't, always, it doesn't always produce conversion, but it's always pleasing to God. Evangelism, proclaiming Christ, is first for God. First, first and above everything else, it's for God. And then in Philippians, last verse, and finish up with this. It's time, isn't it? In Philippians 1.27, he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the Gospel of Christ so that whenever I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the Gospel, not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Our manner of life is to be worthy of the gospel. And then in chapter 2, 14 through 16, he says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And that is a good place to end that just kind of sums up what I've been what I've been trying to convey this morning. I thought about beginning there, but I think it's a good place to end. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Why? So that no one can call you a grumbler. For that reason, so that so you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, without spot, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights. You stand out. It's seen, it's visible, the way you live your life, the way that you talk in your everyday life. And I know I've spoken a lot about the world and I would like to get more into into the the family but just you know I know one question you hear sometimes is from from wives that they spend all day in the house raising children everything I said applies to you in front of your children that's your mission field during that time of your life while you're raising children there's your mission field. Live a holy and godless life in front of your children. You have it hardest of all. Because children can be very annoying and try your patience. And that is a harder situation in many ways than the man who goes out into the workplace. And I'm, I'm not saying women don't, but that, that's to say, everything that I've said, you can take and apply to you inside the home. Living a holy life before them. Adorning 
the doctrine of God, adorning the gospel, living and walking in a manner worthy of our Lord. Same thing can be said there. And children also, children who profess Christ, same thing that goes to you. If you if you are a child and you claim to be a Christian, same thing goes for you in front of your friends. We want to be be blameless. Um, now this this doesn't what I've talked about this morning. It doesn't really apply so much when you go out door to door and you go out into the marketplace and things like that because you're strangers. You're strangers there. But what happens when you run into those people from work when you're out doing evangelism? I know it's happened to me several times. What what happens when you meet them <laughs> there and you're out and you've got a you know, you've got your Bible or a handful of tracts in your hand or something and you're whoop. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's what I have for this morning. I don't what time is it? Is it quitting time? I was hoping maybe there'd be time for some Q and A, but Lord willing it's it was it was clear this was a pro evangelism lesson that primarily has to do with the foundation of it and how we live our lives. Amen. Okay. Anyone have any questions? No? All right. You want me to pray or no. well, Father, we just we thank you for your word and Lord, and just really not even having time to getting into the importance of spending time with you and your word, prayerfully meditating on your word and reading your word. And I just thank you that we have access to your word so richly, so abundantly. Lord, it's at our fingertips at all times, knowing that we have brothers and sisters in the world who long to have just a page out of Scripture. Father, we thank You for the blessing that we have. I pray we wouldn't take it for granted. Lord, I just I thank You for this time, Lord. I pray that You would be at work in Your church here, Lord, and, and everywhere where people call upon the name of the Lord, that you would, you would be working in us, Lord, and as we know You are conforming us to the image of Your Son. Lord, knowing that we are salt and we are light, in the world help us lord help us to to adorn uh, adorn christ in jesus name